the Reverend High Philosopher Priest Ancient Wolf of the Dran Rashar, and I come to you today with answers to 2,000 year old questions. After counsel with other Dran Rashar, we feel it is time to set the record straight and clear up some major misconceptions and deeply ingrained lies. In this video, we will answer the following questions once and for all. Is Yeshua the Son of God? Why is Yeshua's given genealogy in Matthew and Luke listed through Joseph? What happened during the middle years of Yeshua's life not recorded in the Bible? Why was Yeshua crucified? And did Yeshua get married and have children? This last question is of most importance to some of you, but it must be saved until the end to have the proper context. We will also talk about the resurrection, though it is not the focus of this video. First of all, Yes, emphatically, absolutely, yes, Yeshua, Jesus, is the son, the genetic son of the Hebrew God, Yahweh, and the woman Mary. However, that does not mean that he is not also Joseph's son. Joseph is his stepfather, but their relationship was very close. Joseph took the role of being his father, the father of the Messiah, very seriously. It also does not mean that God had sex with Mary. Modern medicine shows us that there are more ways to get pregnant than just sex. How many more methods must be known to God, who has our blueprints and owner's manual memorized? In part, Joseph's close relationship with him is why Yeshua's genealogy was listed as being through Joseph. However, the primary reason for this is because the Essene requirements for the Messiah were that he had to come from the house of David on the father's line. Saying his parentage came from God was a lot harder to prove, but no one would argue that Joseph, Mary's known husband, would be Yeshua's father. Joseph had the proper lineage from the house of David and had raised Yeshua as his own son, Thus, Yeshua's lineage was recorded as being the same as Joseph's lineage. Joseph, as we said, knew that Yeshua was the Messiah, but he also believed that he could handle raising him on his own. Joseph was an Essene who left the order to get married, and he taught Yeshua everything he knew. After the two early incidents in the temple, which you should read about, they're recorded in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 51, Joseph realized that Yeshua needed to be raised in isolation. So he cheerfully left his wife and genetic children to take Yeshua to live with the Essenes. Thus it is recorded in verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years, and in divine and human favor. New Revised Standard Version. Joseph lived with Yeshua among the Essenes for three years until he got word that his eldest genetic son was ill and he returned home to live with Mary. Yeshua wanted to leave with him, but Joseph argued with him and ultimately convinced him to stay behind and continue moving up the ranks among the Essenes. See, Joseph hadn't told the Essenes that Yeshua was the Messiah yet, because they were wary of accepting new messiahs after many false messiahs appeared to lead them. When Yeshua was about 16 years old, he became best friends with his cousin, who became known as John the Baptist. John had a large following among the Essenes, and many people expect, expected him to declare himself to be the messiah, and would have accepted him in that role. However, John knew he wasn't the messiah, in order to avoid the pressure coming from his Essene followers to declare himself the Messiah, he left the order and set out into the wilderness to live a life that was prescribed to him by God. Yeshua eventually saw that the Pharisee corruption of the Essene order was too much for him to lead them as a Messiah and fulfill his mission. So he set out to find his best friend John in the wilderness. This is where the book of Luke in chapter 3 and the other Gospels in the modern Bible pick up on the story and tell us enough of the important information about Yeshua's ministry while encoding some hidden secrets and allegory. Near the end of his ministry, Yeshua is recorded in Matthew chapter 21 starting at verse 12 
as turning over the tables of the money changers in the Temple of Israel. This event, almost alone, piqued the interest of the Romans, as he was disrupting commerce in the name of an essentially communist philosophy. The Sanhedrin hated Yeshua for having so many followers and seeming so much purer than they were, so they bolstered the hatred of Yeshua to the Romans. The Romans were convinced that Yeshua's thousands of followers were going to stage a huge communist political uprising, so they executed Yeshua by the most heinous means possible, torture and crucifixion. Their intent was to humiliate him to his followers and prove that he was not any sort of god nor demigod. Before we talk about the resurrection, I want to clear up the confusion about Barabbas. There is no such custom in either Roman nor Hebrew tradition that would allow for the prisoner freeing described in the Gospels. However, there was a man named Barabbas who was an infamous murderer who did get away with his crimes due to a Roman pardon that involved some backroom dealing. Because it happened around the same time as Yeshua's execution, which was for far less crimes, people were angry that Barabbas got away with his crimes while Yeshua was essentially brutally murdered for having a hot temper. It wasn't long before a story was concocted to combine the two events. The story that we have is rife with the rising anti-Jewish sentiment of the time in which it was written. The fact that Yeshua endured the brutal torture of the Romans only to ultimately live ended up hoisting the Romans by their own petard. Instead of the brutal humiliation and torture of Yeshua disheartening his followers, his ability to endure through it all inspired them to follow him all the more fervently, and his following only grew. This brings us to the resurrection. It is not clear whether Yeshua's half-divine genetics simply allowed him to withstand the brutal torture and attempted execution on the cross, or whether he did die and his divine father intervened quickly enough to revive him, being careful that no one would know for three days while Yeshua could recover enough. In modern medicine, people are regularly brought back from the dead. It is a miracle for modern medicine. But again, how much easier for God? Either way, Yeshua's half-divine genetics played a major role in his ability to walk out of that grave, and either explanation is equally impressive. After his resurrection, his followers feared that the Romans would again try to execute him. So the, the apostles concocted the story of him meeting with Moses and Elijah, and then ascending into heaven. The Romans didn't really buy the story, but since most of Yeshua's followers were convinced of it, the Romans could not get any leads as to where he was. Of course, the Romans were crucifying thousands of people in those days as potential threats to Roman rule, so they didn't waste a lot of resources tracking down one dissident. Because they couldn't waste resources finding Yeshua, they went after his followers, who moved to meeting in secret. Unfortunately, they were separated from the few who knew all of the secrets, and much of the mystery was lost while myth took its place. Yeshua was spirited off to Sicily with his wife, who was recorded in the Bible as Mary Magdalene. He lived in Sicily for three years, where his oldest daughter Anna was born, followed by his oldest son Peter. Anna was named for Mary Magdalene's grandmother and Yeshua's own grandmother. Peter was named after the Apostle, of course. After three years in Sicily, Mary grew tired of the island and they moved to the outskirts of the Roman Empire in France. They had three more boys and one more little girl, the second to the youngest child. This is what happened to Yeshua's children. Anna moved back to Sicily when she was older and fell in love with a Sicilian man to whom she bore many children. She eventually convinced Peter and their youngest brother, Jacob, to move to Sicily as well. Both Peter and Jacob remained unmarried. Yeshua's other children all married and had extensive families, some of which did marry into various royal lines, as has been speculated. However, the presence of Yeshua's and Mary's genetics does not, in and of itself, lend legitimacy to any lineage, royal or otherwise. 
Jacob ended up adopting dozens of orphan children, mostly boys, and this arrangement eventually turned into a kind of monastery, which adopted new people into its ranks over the years. Peter tried to start a ministry of his father's against Anna's advice, but was largely unsuccessful. He eventually retired to Jacob's monastery. His other three children, Yeshua's other three children, settled in France, England, and Spain respectively, with their families settling all throughout Europe. Yeshua only stayed on this earth long enough to see Anna's first two children, his first two grandchildren, who she brought to visit him when he was about to leave this earth. His second oldest son was married three months after Yeshua left this earth. Yeshua believed in the equality of women and that women had special roles in the work of God. Thus, he trained his daughters to be priestesses and his sons to be priests. He did not view their roles as being the same role, simply that they were equal roles. Now, we need to discuss what any of this should mean to your faith. In the end, Yeshua's divinity and his ministry is the same regardless of the facts presented in this video. This video is not intending to discuss Yeshua's role as our Savior, and regardless of your belief on that matter, his teachings of how one should live are invaluably important to each and every human being on this earth. If you would like to read the John Rashar view of Yeshua's saving role, please visit our website and read the New Revelations and World Religions sections. One last thing I need to say before concluding this video is about Paul. Paul is not a true apostle. However, he was a man with good intentions. The saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, could easily have first applied to him, though that's an unlikely etymology for the saying. His letters attempted to solve problems that churches were having while being separated by distance and secrecy. His answers were often intended only for specific situations and didn't always work best even in those situations. His theology was mostly sound, but he had some wild ideas of his own and even contradicted Yeshua and the other apostles. His writings should be taken as containing some wisdom, but mostly they should be considered as apocryphal as the Gospel of Judas, which we may cover in a future video if there's sufficient interest. For more information, visit www.dronrashar.org by simply copy, copying and pasting the URL from the written description of this video below.